This video was brought to you by Slidebean, a web platform that designs your presentations for you. Just add the content and let artificial intelligence do the rest. Get one free month by signing up at slidebean.com slash YouTube. It began as a dream to take mice and plants to Mars and ended up as the first private company to carry NASA astronauts to the International Space Station. And along the way, it survived many crashes and an almost inevitable financial extinction. We are talking, of course, about SpaceX. And today, we are gonna dive deep into its history, filled with crazy anecdotes and valuable lessons to see where the company aims to be soon. So let's get started with SpaceX in this episode of Company Forensics. The beginnings. You and your buddies are flying to Moscow to buy a refurbished intercontinental ballistic missile or ICBM. Hold on, did you know buying used ICBMs was a thing? Anyway, you have one goal, to buy a used ICBM and get closer to your purpose of sending mice and plants to Mars. But the sellers look at you, think you're a rookie and spit on you literally. Well, that's what happened to Elon Musk in 2001. But he wasn't done. One year later, he returned with more talent and most importantly, more cash, a lot more cash. This time, the sellers didn't spit on him and instead drank vodka to begin negotiations. And Musk was serious about negotiations. He wanted not one ICBM, but three. His offer, however, came up short. So again, they mocked him. Pissed off, Musk stormed out of the building and went straight back to the airport. On the flight, he returned to his team and came up with an idea. Guys, I think we can build the rocket ourselves. Back then, Musk wasn't really known for these weird pickup trucks and the Tony Stark vibe. Instead, he was a young dot-com millionaire having made a fortune by selling companies like PayPal. The fortune that he made was now a stepping stone for his obsession, space. With millions in his bank account, he could finally pursue his dreams in a way pretty much only he could. For example, he crashed Mars Society dinners and donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to the organization. In these dinners, which are pretty much a who's who of rich people obsessed with space, he told everybody about his idea to create a Mars greenhouse or maybe even sending mice to Mars and then bring them back, with offspring included. These were crazy thoughts, but there was one idea that stood out. He wanted space travel to be cheap. SpaceX is born. With his goals clear, Musk founded Space Explorations Technologies, SpaceX for short, in El Segundo, California in 2002. Here's a quirky fact for you. SpaceX's location was so massive, Musk could drive straight up to his desk in his silver McLaren. That's the millionaire's life. But he also constructed the place for complete integration. He and the engineering department worked side to side with the construction department. Musk even unloaded cargo himself so he could learn all the details of what people were doing. Musk had also concluded that SpaceX could build 85% or more of a rocket in-house, which would help them free themselves from having to deal with vendors with their higher costs and longer production times. During these first stages, some people called Musk a lunatic while others stepped in to defend him, but it's understandable why people would doubt him. When he announced the first rocket, the Falcon 1, a tribute to the Millennium Falcon, he announced it would carry a 1,400 pound load for $7 million, when the competition was pricing this at around $30 million. The first launch would be in November 2003, just 15 months after founding the company. He even hinted of a trip to Mars by the end of the decade, ambitious to say the least. Musk, however, had a dependable team around him to back up his stock. He hired young, talented individuals with similar determination, such as Tom Mueller, an aerospace engineer who became one of the founding employees at SpaceX. He led the development of the Merlin engine, which is used in the Falcon rockets. And this team was relentless. One story goes that SpaceX needed a turbo pump. A company like Boeing would take five years and $100 million to produce said pump but Musk and Mueller managed to get a supplier to build one in 13 months for $1 million. SpaceX also wanted to shake the industry altogether, according to expert Chad Anderson. In 2004, Musk protested a contract NASA gave 
to a defunct company called Kistler Aerospace, as no other company had the chance to participate. The government sided with SpaceX, further opening the doors for private space transport. But the promised 2003 launch hit bumpy roads. The engine design was taking longer than expected, with rising costs, and Musk had consumed himself in yet another massive project called Tesla. You might have heard of that. He was investing millions into SpaceX and also invested $70 million into Tesla, after which he ended up as CEO. So now he had two companies with visionary ideas, but a thirst for funding. Musk had repeatedly stated that both projects almost collapsed on themselves. SpaceX didn't make the original 2003 deadline, but this didn't deter Musk. He sent the entire team to an island in the Pacific, which was previously used for missile testing, to prepare for the launch. But each time they tried to send Falcon 1 to space, new technical issues came up. So it was back to the drawing board. It wasn't until March 24th, 2006, that conditions seemed adequate for the first Falcon test flight. And so Falcon 1 flew to the heavens. Things were going great until 33 seconds after liftoff when the engine failed and the rocket stumbled to the ground, crashing into a fireball. But Musk was determined to have another launch in six months, even if the rest of the crew felt it would be too soon. Keep in mind, SpaceX needed to get going as fast as possible. So he had a team working on getting Falcon 1 up and running again. Then he assigned another team to work on Falcon 9, a possible replacement for the aging space shuttle program. And meanwhile, he was bidding to become a supplier for NASA flights. All of this without one successful launch. It's important to highlight that by then, SpaceX received seed money coming from Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, that's COTS, from NASA. The funding was initially $278 million. Eventually, it would reach almost $400 million, but it wasn't for Falcon. Instead, its objective was to help in the development of the Falcon 9 project and the Dragon capsule. Falcon 1 was having a tough time getting off the ground. The second and third launches failed, and all the while Musk kept injecting funds both into Tesla and SpaceX. The need for money. Falcon 1 eventually did fly, but it wasn't easy. By the fourth and first successful launch, SpaceX had almost no money and hurried so much, the first stage component still needed improvement and disintegrated upon re-entry. By the time Falcon 1 made its successful maiden flight, SpaceX needed a lot of money and so did Tesla. Sources say Tesla was burning around $4 million per month and Musk has said in retrospect that he almost came down to choosing one of the two, either Tesla or SpaceX to save. The successful Falcon 1 launch did put SpaceX on the map when it came to investors. After all, it was the first private liquid fuel rocket to enter orbit. But it was 2008 and the recession hit hard. Both companies were depleting their funds and it came to the wire as Musk had just a couple of hundred thousand dollars to spare. It came down to the wire. SpaceX caught a big breather when they landed a new contract with NASA to provide a launch platform for space cargo for a healthy $1.6 billion. As for Tesla, Musk managed to gain a new round of funding with $40 million. When? December 23rd, 2008, just days before bankruptcy. That's a Christmas gift. Now, all he had to do was make his rockets work, which is easy, right? As for Falcon 1, it had its second and final successful launch in July 2009. Now, SpaceX focused its attention on the newer and larger Falcon 9. The first noticeable trait, it had not one, but nine Merlin engines. But this was a much more ambitious program. Falcon 9 would be able to carry the most cargo of any spacecraft. And it didn't end there. Along with Falcon 9, SpaceX worked on the Dragon capsule to carry cargo into the International Space Station. If they accomplished this, they would achieve yet another first in the industry. At least it seemed like the lessons learned from Falcon 1 were of great help. 11 months after the final Falcon 1 flight in June 2010, Falcon 9 successfully launched and placed a mock-up of the Dragon capsule in orbit. Then in December of that year, it launched a second time with an operational Dragon capsule. Not perfect though, as on both occasions, the boosters disintegrated in re-entry, but the company kept going. By 2012, its Dragon capsule docked with the ISS, making it the first commercial spacecraft to do so. SpaceX now meant business. Before the launch of the Dragon capsule, its valuation was at around $2.4 billion. After the success, 
that valuation jumped to almost $5 billion. Then they landed a contract to be part of the commercial crew program with NASA and develop a crew capsule for the next generation of US human capabilities. You see, after the shuttle program was canceled, NASA relied on the Russian space program to ferry astronauts to the International Space Station at the sum of $80 million per astronaut. Not a bad deal for Russia, but NASA desperately needed another option. And SpaceX now became a commercially viable space transportation company. By the end of 2012, it had 40 launches. In its 10 year history, the Falcon 9 has launched 89 times with a 98% success rate, one of the highest in the world. SpaceX was so big that even another giant, Google, ended up investing in it as part of a funding round with Fidelity totaling $1 billion in exchange for 8.3% of the company. This was a valuation of 12 billion. The biggest internet company joining a space transport company sounds like space domination to me. Breaking the norm. SpaceX has always aimed to be the cheapest company in space transport. It can manage this through strategies like reusing components, mainly the boosters. Check out the grasshopper tests, they're cool. Also, manufacturing most components in-house allowed SpaceX more control over costs, further lowering them. But the strive for reusability comes at a cost, a mental one that is. Max Vozov, a former employee at SpaceX, recalls that this obsession drove engineers insane and that we could have had Falcon 1 in orbit two years earlier than we did if Elon had just given up on first stage reusability. But then check out what he says. Elon, he forces them to do what's hard and I admire that about him. Well, it did work. Eventually, SpaceX managed to land the Falcon 9 first stage component, which is big news because it can drive the price further down. But let's go back a bit. Why is NASA so expensive? Musk's view on it is exciting and harsh. He believes the contracting system guarantees manufacturers some profit, even if they exceed the advertised price. Shareholders want to make money, and a cheaper option for NASA means less income for them. So Boeing and Lockheed maximize costs on the verge of cancellation. Of course, Boeing and Lockheed have rejected his comments. But he is somehow right. The ULA estimated a cost of $400 million per launch, and the European Ariane program cost $137 million. SpaceX, on the other hand, has offered launches ranging from $50 to $60 million. Now, what does this all mean? SpaceX forced the entire industry to rethink itself. ULA aims to redo its business model. The European Space Agency filed for more subsidies and now looks to lower costs. Meanwhile, countries like China are rushing to create their cheap yet efficient rockets. And unlike the past, SpaceX has proven its worth as of late. In the first quarter of 2020 alone, the company launched as much cargo as China, Russia, and their European efforts combined. But of course, it doesn't stop here. SpaceX continued with the development of the Falcon Heavy, a bigger version capable of more cargo, the Starlink satellite system, a network of 12,000 satellites to provide internet all over the world, and the Starship, a reusable space shuttle which would lower the cost to about 2 million per launch. And yes, the Starship engine did blow up, but this isn't new to SpaceX. In fact, Due to recent success, Musk has accelerated Starship's development. It seems the moon is closer than we thought. The now and the future. Our attention shifts towards the now. Just days ago, when two astronauts in really cool suits took to space in the Crew Dragon reusable spacecraft, the crew version of the original Dragon vehicle, Douglas Hurley and Robert Benkin took off on May 30th amidst these weird times. The entire world watched as Dragon blasted to space, giving us hope for a better tomorrow, even if some used it as a political opportunity. Those two became part of the first ever commercial space flight to place a crew in orbit successfully. Add another notch to the list. But you can tell this is only the beginning. Musk has been clear from the start. He wants to reach Mars. Now, SpaceX proved that it's possible. They are the Wright brothers of commercial space travel. But other companies are catching up with the likes of Jeff Bezos from Amazon with the Blue Horizon project. So we are witnessing the second space race, and it's a private one. There's even talk of the first tourist flight involving a Japanese millionaire. And of course, Musk said yes. SpaceX has failed in the past. It probably will continue to make mistakes, but one can only ask, where will they go next? 
We don't know. And so rises Copy. the new Why era not? of American space flight. They want and the boat. The hope you enjoyed that episode. My space geek comes out when I watch anything that's related to SpaceX. So I hope you enjoyed that as well. Hit that red subscribe button if you want to stay tuned for more company failure and success stories. See you next week.